stop recording for the ones who are not here. Um, let me share uh, the, the screen. Okay, let's begin with a couple of videos and then I'll start the PowerPoint. Let me see where, aha. Uh -huh. Okay, this one, let's begin with the Johann Gothenburg. Who's Jotan, Johann Jonas Gothenburg? He is the father of the printing, okay? Like it says, uh, printing press inventor. Yes, the printing press inventor. Because it, it was a very, very, very important invention which helped to try to expand all the different um, knowledge that began in Italy. And in that way, by the help of the uh, printing press, uh, it could be spread all over Europe. So that's why it was very important, okay? Let's, uh, let's play it, guys. Johannes Gutenberg, he was a printer. He was born in Mainz, electorate of Mainz in the Holy Roman Empire on 1400. His father's name was Friel-Jensfleischitzer Laden, and mother's name was Elswierich. His father was a wealthy cloth merchant. He was the youngest son in the family. There is very little record about the early life of Johannes Gutenberg, but some historians speculate that he studied at the University of Erfurt at some point in 1418. The family of Johannes Gutenberg had to leave Mainz sometime in 1428 due to a raging power struggle between the politicians and the guilds in the city. In Strasbourg, he started working in the jewelry industry and specialized in cutting gems. Gutenberg had claimed that his idea of movable type printing had come to him in a moment of light, or what he called a ray of light. It was in the year 1440, while he was in Strasbourg, that Gutenberg first introduced the then revolutionary concept of printing to his partners. A significant portion of his life is not on record during the period between 1444 and 1448. His brother-in-law gave him a loan in order to start his own business, and although it is speculated that it might have been for a printing press, it could also have been used for his goldsmith business. In the year 1450, Gutenberg had successfully opened up his printing press. Later on Gutenberg was able to take out a substantial loan from the moneylender Johann Fust for his workshop. He opened up his workshop in the year 1452, and it was in that workshop that he first decided to print the Bible, which he was sure would be a profitable venture. However, he has another press, in which he published run-of-the-mill books like textbooks and Latin or church indulgences. It was in the year 1455 that he printed his first copy of the Bible, which later came to be known as Gutenberg's Bible. Initially he had printed in 180 copies, and needless to say it did not seem like a venture that would have brought him a huge amount of profit. In 1456, Gutenberg's main financial backer Johann Fust sued him for misappropriation of funds, and in an unfortunate turn of events, Gutenberg lost the court battle. He had run out of money due to the Bible project, and in addition to that the printing workshop was turned over to Johann Fust. Not a lot is known about his personal life, but since there is record of him taking a loan from his brother-in-law, there are speculations that he might have got married. It is not known if he had any children or not. 
Although Gutenberg's invention of the movable printing technology was completely ignored by Johann Fust, who took over his printing press, in 1465, he was honored with the title Hoffman, which literally meant gentleman of the court. He died in Mainz, electorate of Mainz in the Holy Roman Empire, on February 3, 1468, aged about 68. What is truth? Truth is something so noble, that if God could turn aside from it, I would keep the truth and turn aside from God," said Johannes Gutenberg. <laughs> Let's watch the other video. Let's stop here. this video the other one talks about it's the Italian Renaissance versus Northern Renaissance remember um, uh, the topic is beyond Italian Renaissance so it, is, it means that the Renaissance spread all over Europe so they are going to compare what the uh, the rest of Europe did in, in uh, and compare with uh, the Italian Renaissance in Italy okay that in this uh, sort of tutorial segment is comparison, which is one of the four thinking skills that could come up on your LEQ, your long essay question, if you are taking a push, AP Euro, or AP World. So what we're going to do is we're going to compare the Italian Renaissance and the Northern Renaissance. And in comparing, remember that we need to look at the differences and the similarities. Now, this is where a lot of people lose points on an essay because when they hear compare, they just think contrast. They think different. Differences. So the first thing that's very important is that you are keeping in mind differences and similarities. Now I've got similarities underlined here because a lot of times the differences are much easier to emphasize than the similarities, but we need to make sure that we do both. Now, first of all, there is the Italian Renaissance that is typically characterized as individualistic and secular and then there's the Northern Renaissance that is characterized as more socially oriented and Christian in comparison to the Italian Renaissance. So when we're setting up our essay for our long essay question, what we have to do here, this is a pre-writing setup that I'm gonna be recommending to my students this year and we'll be working on in the eight month writing clinic. The Italian Renaissance will need something here, a contrasting characteristic or a few characteristics and supporting evidence. And then over here, here, we will need contrasting characteristics and supporting evidence for the Northern Renaissance. So for everything in the Italian Renaissance column, there needs to be a counterpoint in the Northern Renaissance column. And then after we do that, we need to find something they have in common. It doesn't have to be great, but it needs to be something that comparison and contrasting needs to happen. So let's think about how we would do this and how we would create an argument comparing the Italian Italian Renaissance and the Northern Renaissance. Now, what I'll do here is I'd like to start off with my evidence. So you need at least two pieces of evidence to get the first evidence point. And in order to do that, I think the best way to compare the Italian Renaissance and the Northern Renaissance would be to take Machiavelli's The Prince and put it up against Thomas More's Utopia. So we have one of the classic works of the Italian Renaissance and another of the Northern Renaissance. First of all, Machiavelli's The Prince is about how to be an effective leader. It is individualistic. It is about how to improve yourself as an individual who is seeking to acquire power. Whereas Thomas More is focusing more on the ideal society. And this goes along with the tendency of Northern Renaissance humanists to focus on social reform. Now, when you look at Machiavelli, it is better to be feared than loved. The end justifies the means. This is a secular approach. This is not Christian. You can't imagine the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are those who are feared, for they will get what they want. I would love to write a Sermon on the Mount according to Machiavelli. One of these days I might get to it. If you ever work on it and want to send it to me, if you get there first, let me know. Now, when you go to Thomas More's Utopia, you see the abolition of property and then this idea that 
wealth corrupts people. Now, this is an idea that is very prominent in Christianity, and especially when you look at Catholic theology in particular, you'll see where, you know, Catholic clergy take a vow of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Now, the extent to which they were keeping those vows during the Renaissance is up for debate, but Thomas More is writing from an obviously Catholic Christian perspective. So when you look at these two works, you can use them both as evidence to support the characterization of the Italian Renaissance as more secular and individualistic and the characterization of the Northern Renaissance as more Christian and more socially oriented. So, you know, you're really kind of throwing this all together that the evidence is supporting a point. Now, what about for what they have in common? Well, you might think this would be difficult, but then again, it's very easy because when it comes down to it, both Machiavelli and Thomas More both the Italian humanist and the Northern humanist were inspired by classical studies. So they were driven by humanism. Now, if you want to be a little more specific and offer some evidence, you could say that Machiavelli was imitating ancient Rome. Uh, he was looking at ancient Rome for his inspiration to that. And then Thomas More was, of course, writing on the model of Plato. Plato's Republic explored the idea of the ideal state. Now, if you're going for the second evidence point, you want to introduce some more things, you could go into more authors. For the Italian Renaissance, you go into Pico, Della Mirandola, you go into Petrarch or Castiglione, whereas for the Northern Renaissance, you could bring in Erasmus. But what I'm really trying to do here is get you set up to write a basic essay. So if you like what you heard here, think about signing up for my eight-month writing clinic. You can click for more information, and that is going to be available all year. We've got different levels of access. So give that some thought, and I will be back soon, possibly with some more tutorial screencasts and definitely with some more content lectures soon. It's always a pleasure. Okay, now this is what I got uh, for you uh, as uh, videos. Now let's uh, begin the class with the PowerPoint or the information that is already in the book. I'm trying to summarize this chapter. Renaissance, yes, this is Renaissance, it's the one. Okay. Also, these PowerPoints are ready, and some videos are ready. I loaded up in your platform in Neo also. Okay, so you have more information about these topics. Okay, now the second topic we are going to study in this trimester is uh, the Renaissance beyond Italy. Remember, all this movement started in Italy, and basically in these four and these four towns, you know, Florence. Um, I don't remember the other ones. Okay, so anyway, basically in Florence began with the Medici family. Remember the Medici family? Okay. Now let's begin the main idea, the paper printing. Thanks to this invention, the knowledge could be spread out all over the Europe. So paper printing and new university also led to spread a new ideas throughout Europe. Spread of a new ideas. Now travelers and artists help spread the Renaissance throughout Europe. But the development of printing was a giant step, definitely, in a spreading idea. For the first time ever, thousands of people could read books and share ideas about them. People print paper and printing. By the late 1700, paper making had spread from China to the Middle East. Remember, the paper began in China. It was invented in China, but they, by those years, is that um, uh, entering Europe, the Middle East. From, from there, it came to Europe. Okay, from this area came to Europe. Europeans factories were making paper by the 300, 300, uh, 1,300 years. Because it was cheaper, and easier to prepare paper to replace the animal skins because they used to write over the animal skins, okay? In which people had written before. Now then, in the mid 
1,400, a German man, Johann Gutenberg, developed a printing press that used movable type. That is, each letter was separated piece. Over here, this is an example where you have to create the what you want to write, and then you put all letter by letter by letter, and then you press this, and then you print over the paper. Very genius invention. Then the worker could rearrange the letters in the frame to create new pages. How, how much faster printing was than writing? No, definitely was way, way faster. Now, the first printed book was the Bible. Now, this is an example of the Bible that they printed back in those years. This over here, this picture. The Bible as a book, the first printed edition, this one. Uh, in uh, printed in the Latin language, and it was printed in Latin in about 1455, the year 1455. Soon some thinkers began to call for the Bible to be translated into common language. Uh -huh. Although the Catholic Church fought strenuously against it. So the, the, the church, they didn't want it to be translated into a normal language. So the Bible was eventually translated and printed. So the, the, the church, they, they didn't agree that, because it says that it's gonna lose a lot of meanings, different meanings. When you translate definitely, it loses it lose a lot of, doesn't make sense sometimes. So you have to be a very, very good translator in order to really translate what it means from one language to another. Now, church le leaders object on the ground that some words was not accurate, definitely. I, I, um, uh, my degree is in translation. I am, I am, I studied translation at the university. And definitely it's very difficult to translate. For instance, in Spanish, how could I say, well, well, that's, that's uh, any kind of uh, expression here in Panama. Any kind of expression. I, I, I can't remember right now, but there's a lot of, uh, like, like for instance, uh, like sometimes people, when you translate, you could mistranslate it. For instance, if you, if you said, está embarazada, está embarazada. In, in, in English, it's pregnant. But if you translate it, literally, it's, it's is embarrassed. She is embarrassed, but embarrassed doesn't mean that she's pregnant. So that's why it's very difficult to, to translate it literally. So you have to know, really know the language in order to see what is, what is the really word in context. So that's why the church, they didn't agree that, because uh, that, uh, it wasn't very accurate, okay? They also did not want people to interpret it. Aha, uh -huh, that's, that's another thing. You have to interpret the Bible on their own without guidance for the church, without guidance. Now over here, there is a, a line time of how the, uh, the printing machine was uh, developed. Over here from the year 1000 until, the, year, until uh, uh, the 20th century. This is the 20th century, okay? Now let's move on. Now, because of this, a lot of universities start uh, uh, um, spreading all over Europe. So students from around Europe travel to Italy to study at Italian university. By the early uh, 1500, most of the teachers in this university were humanists. Students from Northern Europe who studied with this teacher took Renaissance ideas back to them to their home countries. However, many of these new scholars became teachers in Europe University. In addition, new universities opened in France, Germany, and Netherlands. Because these schools were set up by humanists, Renaissance ideas about the value of people spread throughout Europe. Why? Because they went to study in Italy and then they went back to their own countries and they uh, took part in their university and tried to ex uh, expand or spread all these um, humanism movement. Okay, now this is an example of uh, one of the most important 
university in the world. Now, the University of, of, of Oxford opened in the early 1200th century. During the Renaissance, it began. Now, this is, I think it's located in England, University of Oxford, a very famous university. And you can see how old this university is. During the Renaissance, it began to teach Greek and Roman classics. Today, many, I can't see what it, what it says at the end. But anyway, this is an example of those universities uh, that start spreading all the Renaissance throughout Europe back in those days. Now, although only men could attend university, <laughs> only men, no women, <laughs> women also helped spread these ideas. Many noble families educated their daughters uh -huh. at home, ah, so sick. at home, not in the university. They encouraged young women to study classical literature, philosophy, and art. Some educated women became powerful politician feet. They marry novels from around Europe and chorus the spread of Renaissance ideas in their husband's land. Okay. Poor women. Always, always you are, have, uh, you are not allowed to do different things. But anyway, thanks God we are in 20th century, 21st century right now. So you can do anything you like, anything you think you want to do. Okay. So let's stop right here and then um tomorrow we'll finish this chapter very interesting chapter and please try to complete the vocabulary is also in order and then the assess okay you did it <laughs> excellent job excellent uh also okay actually excellent excellent actually. now the rest of the guys please try to complete it okay try to complete the assessment question they are very easy assessment question guys okay now i think next week we are gonna have the first forum test, okay? So next week we're gonna have, it's gonna be the same, we are gonna use the same pattern that we did in the first one. I'm gonna arrive at statements, I think, and then you have to give me your ideas. And then the other, your, 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 your friends need to, to choose two students and make some comments on those uh on those um answers from your friends so the same thing okay are we clear and also that's gonna be the first day and in the second class then we are going to discuss it i'm gonna ask you each person one by one give me give me what uh your opinions about what you did yours and your your opinions about your friends what you come what you comments about what they wrote so this is gonna it's gonna do the same the same way we did last 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 trimester okay guys okay so be prepared it's gonna be about re everything about renaissance okay so you need to be an expert in renaissance okay guys so see you next week guys have a nice week and enjoy it and please uh complete all the activities guys okay bye take care bye bye